Coming up on One Detroit, five years after the water switch in Flint, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha on what we've all learned. Also ahead, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell and Congressman Fred Upton on getting things done in Washington with the impeachment investigation looming. Plus, do you know where almond boneless chicken started? That's the question. Yeah, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> the Chinese menu staple, that's all Michigan. And then programs that help more students get into skilled trades. I'm Christy McDonald. Join me on the city's east side at the Commons. One Detroit is coming up. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV the Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund, and by Business Leaders for Michigan has five priorities to make Michigan a top 10 state. Achieve a balanced budget, cut long-term debt, fix our roads, improve all levels of education, further economic growth, plan for a stronger Michigan. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Also brought to you by Ally, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. We have a busy and beautiful week as fall really gets started. And thanks so much to the Commons here on the east side for having us. Well, they're still battling it out in Lansing over spending. The UAW and GM are still at odds. And in Washington, they're struggling to get things done with an impeachment investigation. So coming up, Nolan Finley sits down with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell and Congressman Fred Upton from our Michigan delegation to talk about what is and what is not happening in Washington. Plus, we'll take you to one Detroit classroom where students are preparing for jobs in the skilled trades. Also coming up on the show, it's a Chinese restaurant favorite, almond boneless chicken. But did you know it's uniquely Michigan? The real story behind ABC, you'll never look at Chinese carry out the same way. That's just ahead for you. But we are starting the show with a milestone. Five years ago, Flint switched its water supply to the Flint River without proper treatment. And that triggered the water crisis that impacted an entire city, exposed adults and children to dangerously high levels of lead, and shook their faith in government. Five years after that switch, concerns are still there today. A recent PBS NewsHour report shows there are still lines for bottled water in Flint, even after the water supply has been switched and new lines are being installed across the city. Greater Holy Temple Church of God in Christ hands out more than 1,700 cases a week. Medical programs are tracking and treating children with lead exposure from the water crisis. There are early literacy programs in schools, home visits for support. But there is unease about the recovery and trusting what comes out of the tap. Stephen Henderson recently had a conversation on WDET Public Radio with Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, the pediatrician who first sounded the alarm about lead levels in children. She's written a book about what happened in Flint and is a crucial part of the recovery process. There was a blindness towards Flint. People literally closed their eyes, even when they knew something was wrong, and they looked away. And what I hope that this you know, book and this story conveys is really kind of our, our obligation to open our eyes, to not be so myopic, uh, to have a, you know, a different level of empathy and understanding to our neighbors, um, and to open really each other's eyes. We were very deliberate to make sure that we wanted science to lead our recovery. Um, and, and in terms of how we moved forward. We couldn't take away this crisis. There's no like magic pill or no antidote. This crisis was also not just specific to lead, uh, Legionnaires outbreak where people died from pneumonia, skin issues, but also this broader kind of betrayal and these feelings of 
uh, you know, loss of trust and anger and guilt, all those also lead to poor outcomes. This was like a big population level trauma. Um, so we have also leaned on the emerging science of, of trauma, of trauma and from care, of child development, of early adversity, of brain plasticity, this really holistic response that we've been able to put into place in Flint. Um, especially for our youngest children um, it, it, towards the recovery. So we kind of created all this long list of demands of what we wanted from the state, from the feds, from philanthropy, leaning on this science of child devel development, things like um, you know early on home visits and high quality childcare and nutrition access and expanded Medicaid and WIC and all these things that we have been able to put in place in Flint. And that is all based on what the science tells us promotes the development of children. And when I was able to lean on that science, like here's Dr. Mona as a pediatrician and as a scientist um, sharing what needs to be done, I felt that I was able to get more of that mm. rather than here's somebody who's really angry and you know, you know, bangs her head at night because of what happened. Um, but when you lean on the science, I, I, I felt that we were more um, likely to get things to happen and, and more likely to get bipartisan support. Yeah. You know, the story of Flint, so many people think it's a story of like, oh, this is government failure. Like this is government failure at literally every level of, of government. Um, but for me, the story of, of Flint is really very much of, of how government can work for you. Um, so Flint lost democracy. So we had no like locally elected officials. But the, the folks that were elected, like Senator Ananick, like our state rep, our congressional delegation, Congressman Kildee, Senator Stabenow Peters, they never stopped fighting for Flint. Um, and they reaffirmed to me what good government can be. So that was also very much reaffirmed. Um, but something that, that changed kind of throughout this process, I used to think uh, as a pediatrician, like we kind of had a monopoly on caring for children. Like, I mean, like who else cares about kids like more than pediatricians? Um, and that I was proven wrong time and time and time again, because this story is not about one person. This story is about a team. Um, it is about this amazing team of folks that came together via serendipity or not, um, that couldn't have been more different than each other, that were from so many different disciplines and walks of life that came together and because they didn't accept the status quo and they wanted to make things better for kids. As for the criminal investigation into negligence over the Flint water crisis, the Attorney General's office dismissed all pending charges against eight people this past summer in order to restart the investigation and look for new evidence. We will keep you posted on that. All right, turning now to Washington, D.C., and the public pressure on Congress to say whether or not they support the impeachment investigation into President Trump. Nolan Finley spoke with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell and Congressman Fred Upton when they were in town about the process and what really can get done in Washington. Our job is to keep this country together, to protect our democracy, to protect our Constitution. And while these investigations are going on, we've got to make sure that we don't let this country get tear, torn apart more. And I'm not on those committees. Mm -hmm. I'm on other committees. I'm working with Fred Upton on lowering drug, the cost of prescription drugs. I'm working on PFAS. I'm working on getting a trade deal for workers that have been out walking picket mm -hmm. lines. I'm working on issues that matter to people every day, and we have to do and both. We'll get to those issues in, in a second because I think they're important. But Fred, we're, and I'll note, we're taping this interview a week out before it airs, and this story is changing by the hour. So, but at this point, the impeachment proceedings, do you see it as a political witch hunt or something that's necessary to get to the bottom of what's uh, what's been going on well, in the White a, House. A couple things. Uh, I'm not on one of the relevant committees that mm -hmm. is beginning to investigate this either. Uh, I remember well the Clinton impeachment trial mm -hmm. uh, back in, in the 90s and how it really did consume just about everything. Yeah. And we are now in a new fiscal year. We have yet to see the Senate pass a single uh, appropriation bill. We we'll have another continuing resolution. We have lots of issues, uh, whether it be a defense authorization bill, mm -hmm. issues before the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee, a uh, whole host of things. And, uh, you know, it, as I look at where we are today, I, I think there are legitimate questions that need to be answered. Uh, it, they are going to be answered. So the, the message, tell the truth the first time, you don't have to worry about it a second. What is possible in this environment? I mean, can you all go to Washington, go back to Washington and sit down and say, hey, 
let's move this trade bill. Let's get a vote on this trade bill and send it to the president. Can you do to do the environmental issues you talked about? Can you do prescription drug prices? Can you do immigration reform? What's possible in the environment in Washington today? So it is possible. Debbie and I are both members of this caucus uh, called the Problem Solvers. Mm -hmm. It's a bipartisan caucus. Mm -hmm. We were successful in changing the rules of the House to really encourage more bipartisanship. One of the things that we're going to do right away when we come back, and we've been working I'm on an immigration little side task force as part of that group, and we're hoping to have a bipartisan bill, particularly focused on the ag side on immigration. Uh, but a number of us went down to the Texas border in July to see the crisis mm -hmm. that indeed is there and what can we do to change a, uh, and fix a broken system. So that's a big priority for us. Fred and I working on many issues that matter to the state mm -hmm. of Michigan and matter to the country aren't working on them through uh, problem solvers, but are actually doing it through committee, the Energy and Commerce Committee, mm -hmm. which has had a long history of working together on very tough issues in a bipartisan way. All right, let's change gears here to celebrate something uniquely Michigan, but maybe you didn't realize it. If you're a fan of Chinese food around here, chances are you've had almond boneless chicken. But where did this dish start? Well, that's what one Detroit senior producer, Bill Kubota, wanted to know. So take a look at what he found. Go missing. So we are here to get the last whatever they got. Last supper at Kim's. Yeah, the last supper at Kim's. Last Kim. Chinese supper at Kim's. Kim's here in Troy, Michigan since 1974, closing for good. What's your favorite dish? Sweet and sour chicken <laughs> and egg drop soup. <laughs> How about almond, you? Almond boneless chicken. Yeah. Number what do you know about almond boneless chicken? I don't know very much about it, but Kim's makes the best that I've ever had. <laughs> this is an old line Chinese restaurant, one of Metro Detroit's mainstays these past 50 years. First booth on the right hand side. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I knew we would get busier, but I just didn't know how busy we would get, how many people wanted to come and say goodbye. Margaret Yee and her siblings spent their lifetimes building this business, but the next generation of Yees have other career plans. Hi. Oh, now I can give you a hug. <laughs> At least I have a breathing minute. I know, I felt so bad. Kim's features Cantonese cuisine, you might say Detroit-style Cantonese, with a signature dish something the next generation Chinese Americans who worked in their parents' restaurants know all about. Almond chicken is most definitely like the king of Chinese food. I would, I would say for Michigan Chinese, almond chicken is the most iconic. Everybody knows what ABC means, almond boneless chicken. We would always put ABC on it so we could differentiate what we were packing in the carryout. Lots of customers now they put the order, I want ABC. It's a Michigan thing. ABC's origins go back to southeastern China, not far from Canton, now called Guangzhou, on the Pearl River Delta sits the city of Toisan. Toisan, not pronounced like it's spelled. Toisan is like where the huge emigration patterns happen. So our uncle came to Michigan with, and it's like, why didn't you go to San Francisco here? <laughs> and they landed in Cass Corridor in Chinatown. And so then, of course, he brings over his like seven siblings. And now my dad's side was all here, but they're all Toisan. Many decades ago, career paths for Chinese in Detroit were limited, washing clothes or serving food. My grandfather said, well, I try laundry, but when the business is slow, I have nothing to eat. But at least if I worked in the restaurant when business is slow, I still have all these food I can eat. I won't go hungry. Detroit's Chinatown restaurants shared recipes and adapted them for American tastes. Then the restaurants moved to the suburbs where ABC became a top seller. At the Golden Crown in Bloomfield Hills, Connie Lowe has been making it for more than 40 years. The older generation, they live in Michigan, they come out with this. Does anybody know who came up with it first? That's, that's the question. Yeah, that's the million dollar question. Don't know. Well, there's some ideas of like which restaurant might have started it, but I don't know. I would never say. When they first started the almond boneless chicken, they didn't call it almond boneless chicken, they call it washu gai. A washu gai? Yeah, mm -hmm. we heard that many, many of times throughout the years. Yeah. <laughs> Saying washu gai was a little too hard for a lot of people. And actually, washu doesn't really translate to almond boneless chicken. <laughs> 
But looking at the dish, people were able to describe it, and I think that's probably what happened. A simple presentation. No secret ingredients, but a key one, cornstarch, which will help give ABC its crunch. The reason I put the little cornstarch because I want to make sure they absorb all the water so it won't be so watery. Then comes the breading and the frying. So I dip on the breading and make sure the breading is even. It's, it's all in the technique of frying the chicken and the right temperature, when to bring it out. It's all in the technique. The chopped fried chicken rides on a bed of lettuce. And then we put gravy on top. Then some onions. At the Golden Crown, they used to add slivered almonds until Connie began to worry about customers with nut allergies. Now, no almonds. And no loss for ABC enthusiast Ro Roosh. Now let me demonstrate. This chicken, when you go to open it up, is actually white and soft, and it is not dried out. ABC comes with many dining options. So I always like to put it on my rice so I have the sauce on it. Everybody different. Some exactly. people ask for more lettuce. Some people say, I don't want no lettuce. I don't put it on top. I always put the rice on the side. So that's two different ways that you can have yeah. it. Yeah. But also in the gravy, there's water chestnuts for crunchiness. Mm -hmm. So you have more texture than just the chicken and it's the good. batter. It's still crispy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just kind of gain the craving and you love, like, you end up loving the food that's there. But then your parents tell you, like, uh, that's not real Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> no. How about Chinese-American food? Susie Moy had to leave home to learn the real story about ABC. When she moved to San Francisco, she was expecting almond chicken out there, and when she got out there, she's like, the Chinese food's not the same out here as it is back home. Oh, I can't tell you how many restaurants, was, one, you would ask about almond chicken, they're like, oh yeah, we got almond chicken, and we're like, is it deep fried? Or you would try to describe it, they're like, oh no, not deep fried. And then. And then sometimes they would say that they have it was deep fried, but it would be like a stir fry. So I have a lot of customers, they moved to Chicago, they moved to Florida. Whenever I come back to visit, they always have an almond chicken because of these, they don't have it anywhere else. Well, it's kind of like Detroit pizza. People really didn't know about Detroit pizza. We had our own pizza. It wasn't just New York or Chicago. Like Square Pizza and Coney Island hot dogs, our cuisine has been discovered in other places. Almond boneless chicken, you can also find it in Columbus, Ohio. Mm -hmm. So there is something those Buckeyes love about Michigan after all. Something to think about the next time you're ordering takeout. Thanks, Phil. And finally, we hear a lot about job openings in the skilled trades, and there are programs to prepare young people for these jobs. As part of our American Graduate Initiative, here's a look at some of the classes at Randolph Career Technical Center as part of Detroit Public Schools. So I am a journeyman inside wireman. I have been in for over 20 years. What about you? You finish your paperwork? I love being out there in the field. You know, I go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any of those guys anytime, any day. But I asked, I said, I need to be in a position where I can help more younger people realize how this is done, get more females into the trade, and this just kind of fell in my lap. Once we start showing them that, it's like, oh, I can make that much money? Oh, yeah but they're not gonna pay you that money to sit there on your cell phone, you know, looking cute. So you gotta come there, you gotta work. There's a, definitely a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow. <laughs> I think the students actually have more respect because we are women, okay? Andrew, where are you with your lab six paperwork? When you have two females that have been in the trades for 20 plus years, you know, doing this stuff, it's like, whoa. You know, there's that level of respect automatic. I think that some of them see. I let them know, hey, women can do this, you know, especially our female students. My kids live in neighborhoods where they can walk outside their door and say, wow, how could I make that look better? The skills that we offer to these students are marketable skills, but they're skills that they could be used each and every day of their lives. 
there is still the idea that you gotta go to college to be successful. And so I find myself making sure that I put certain individuals in front of my kids, people that look like that, because then I know that my students can picture themselves like them in a few years. I've been considering a lot. I'm kind of all over the place with that, but yeah, I've been considering this as well. Like, I want to be a lawyer for a few <laughs> minutes there, um, but yeah, I'm still trying to figure it out. For this and for really any of the trades, the kids, they need to be serious about their math classes. You have to calculate like what type of wire you need or for like to hold the electricity. I would do math games like that. Ian. Math every day to kind of brush up on that if you need help. You're on a job site. Your phone's dead. You don't have a calculator. How are you going to get your measurements? Okay. I'm 42 years old and I've lived in Detroit my entire life. This is something amazing. I've seen the, the opportunity of going from having a job to having a career. The difference of having uh, just a regular nine to five and having a skill. I was working a supplier for Ford. I was doing quality control work there. Man, you know, I think I was making $12 an hour. I might not have even been making that. When I actually started my apprenticeship, we started off at 1742. So that was a large jump. 46 on the So I'm a very proud product of the DPS. And at no point did I know anything about being in the trades. That was something that wasn't mentioned to me. As a matter of fact, it was kind of looked down upon. Like if you had a college degree, you were better than someone. But what I've found is that it's, it's completely the opposite. I've seen some of the most intelligent people I've met that's in the trade. Okay. I don't see as many as I would like to see when I see people like me when I go on a job site. But I think those numbers will increase because we need them to. Now we're in the midst of all these great developments happening in the city. We're in the midst of a shortage of skilled trades workers. So why not make sure that our youth are a part of that? My mother and my father, they actually encouraged me to get into the field. The trades are better than the college because, you know, I don't want to have like a business job, you know, like sitting down at the table. I want to be more hands on, like, and being able to help somebody out. Like when somebody electricity go out, you know, you can go and fix it. And then, there's the, you know, you're the solution for their problem. When you go to college, you, you're taking out, you know, multiple loans. And then by the time you finish college, you know, you're going to be in debt. You're going to have to pay that money back. You know, you go in a trade. You know, you can go out in the field while you're um, learning in classes. Every day, 20 people retire from, like, the trades. And that's 20 spots that they need jobs, because only, like, one person goes to fill that. There's a lot of space for, like, us to come up and kind of work there. So this opportunity that these children have here in Detroit is totally unique, because there's nowhere in the country. Like, uh, you don't get this kind of knowledge base to you go to the community colleges or to the union hall to an apprenticeship. We're gonna take these pieces of framing channel and they're gonna go across this way. In the world of being an electrician, we do so much more than just putting wires in walls. It's really kind of a little logic project to say, all right, the signal starts here and it goes there and then it comes back, but then I have to change the level of it. And that's a lot of what we do in the field when we're dealing with energy control systems for a building. So the limit switch is going to sit down in here. You know, you're starting off with this little pip squeak signal that's coming from a, a thermocouple. It's in millivolts. And ultimately, that's what controls a, a heater that's consuming thousands of watts or hundreds of thousands of BTUs of energy. I don't know, it's different. I would never thought it was something that has to do with electrical because like we working on like, you know, wiring and stuff like that, you know. There's definitely not enough women in here. And, and I'm always reaching out to females and, and you get the same thing. Oh, it's a dirty job. Oh, it's too hard. Oh, I can't do it. I'm like, yeah, you're dirty. Yeah, it's a hard job, but you know what? You got enough money that every weekend you can get your hair did, you can get your nails did, you can go to the spa, you can do whatever you want to. So, I mean, just take advantage of the opportunities. American Graduate Getting to Work is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. 
For more information on our skilled trades and education programs, just head to DetroitPBS.org. And make sure you check out the national documentary airing this Sunday called Journey to Jobs. It's part of the American Graduate Getting to Work Initiative, public media's commitment to help communities illuminate pathways to gainful employment in America. And that is going to do it for us. Thanks so much to the Commons for the bottomless cups of coffee. Cheers, ladies. And thanks so much for joining us. I'll see you next time on One Detroit. Take care. Support local journalism with One Detroit. Go to dptv.org slash One Detroit and click donate. Receive a limited edition One Detroit mug as a thank you gift. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund. And by Business Leaders for Michigan has five priorities to make Michigan a top 10 state. Achieve a balanced budget. Cut long-term debt. Fix our roads. Improve all levels of education. Further economic growth. Plan for a stronger Michigan. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Also brought to you by... Ally, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.